Welcome back to the STEM Swag Podcast. I'm your host, Temple, and you already know this podcast is all about me introducing you to the coolest STEM professionals, and our guest today is no different. She's a virtual reality pioneer and expert who has made history by creating and teaching entire university subject courses in virtual reality classrooms. She's conducted research in analytic chemistry, molecular biology, and neurochemistry. She's very proud to be called Dr. M-O-M, which stands for Motor of Minds, and I'm so excited to have her on stage today. Please welcome to the save, Dr. Musina Morris. Hey! Hey! <laughs> I'm so, so, so excited to have you on this podcast. You are so cool. And like me, one of my favorite things is that you're from Atlanta. Um, but I'm so excited to go ahead and get into what you are, who you are, and the incredible things that you have done in STEM. So go ahead and kind of explain to us what you do, because I know virtual reality, I'm so excited. I have my own Oculus here with me today because I was prepared for this. So please tell us kind of what you do. Okay, so I am a biomolecular chemist by training who decided to bring the molecular world to life for students taking advanced in organic chemistry in the spring of 2021. But that's really not the first time that I ever used virtual reality in the classroom. I was a science research coordinator for a program called Upper Bound. And I, me and we were just trying to engage students. We didn't want them sitting behind Zooms all day. So yeah. we came up with a way to partner with this ed tech company out in Iowa, believe it or not, um, called Victory XR. And that rea virtual reality project was just like a taste of what we do now. So now we do it in a synchronous learning platform. Mm -hmm. Students within all disciplines are able to engage. Um, but for me, it was really about how do I build visual spatial intelligence in STEM students? And how do I keep them persisting in their major during a time when there were, we were seeing so many learning losses? And it just turned into a whole situation ship. Uh, so it's a lot more than it was. I'm now in the Department of Education and I am making sure to develop metaverse of teaching and learning as a pedagogy and a strategy, an active learning strategy. And so I have trained people all over the country who want to implement their metaversities. I train organizations on how to implement metaverse technologies. I do a little gen AI stuff. I do a little intellectual property stuff, blockchain, Web3, you name it, I play in it. So I'm at the bottom of the rabbit hole. If you go down it, I'm there. We're going to find you. That's so how do you go from chemistry to the metaverse? Like that's just so, I guess people would think it's far out, but really everything in STEM is connected. So how did you get from, that's what you're like professionally, that's what you graduated from, that's what you're supposed to do to being in this metaverse? So when I was working on my doctorate, so I'm a biomolecular chemist, but the work that I did was with instrumentation. So I'm an analytical chemist as well. And we used very pricey, very sophisticated software to engage our instruments. So I was always the person that was troubleshooting the technology. For one, me and computers, just we just go together. Ever since my daddy bought me my, um, my computer as a young girl, then like ever since then, my Commodore 64 playing Donkey Kong, learning how to just type as a word processing app, you know, like just learning about a computer or my way around a computer. I've always been like the person in my family that knew computers the most. So I was always a techie um, and I always use technology to engage my students. So if if it when the cell phone became like a part of the classroom accessory, I was like, you got your cell phones, take it out. We're going to use it. It's your subject matter expert for the day. It, you know, so I was that kind of person that always incorporated it, not just into the research that I did, but also into the teaching practice. Mm -hmm. So students always had to use some kind of technology in my classes. I remember the first time that I really used my cell phone was fourth grade in math. I think that really kind of set the thing because um, in my generation, we were still kind of not all the way fully into technology when we first went to school or while we were growing up. And now we're fully immersed in it. Like you can't do anything without your phone. Our classes that we can't have our phone in, we struggle. 
Um, but that kind of still getting used to technology and still kind of knowing from a young age. But how is that from you from being a whole generation where you had to kind of learn how to type code to be able to type? I know that. Oh, that I could not imagine doing that. I took computer science just for fun. It was nothing that I thought I was going to get into. Right. Listen, I dropped out of computer science. I was in AP computer science. And the first day I was like, listen, the way that I can't tell a computer everything because I just don't have time. So I actually, so it's funny now that I do code. I know how to code. I've taken boot camp courses and stuff and taught myself. And I'm really pretty good at it. Do I like to do it? I think it's tedious. Will I do it? Oh, yeah. If it's going to solve a problem and I got to get the job done, I'm actually going to do it. So. Now, speaking of AI and the metaverse, I know the big thing that we kind of heard about was Ready Player One, which is one of my favorite movies that I watch with my mom, or when somebody tried to buy a house next to Snoop Dogg in the metaverse. What exactly is the metaverse? When we're hearing this term, we know kind of what it means, but can you give us that explanation? So the metaverse just means that you are existing in a persistent virtual world, a virtual world where there's real-time 3D assets, objects, and spaces. That means that just like in this real world, if you go and you take your glasses and you put them on the table here, if then you go, another person comes by, those glasses should still be on that table in that virtual room. Now they can pick it up and move it. And the next person that passed by might say, you move my glasses. Why'd you move my glasses? Because that space persists as the way that it is, is fixed in that way. So when we say a persistent shared virtual world where you can be work, play, and learn all in the same synchronous type of environment. That's what we mean. It's similar to just this, except for you're showing up as your avatar self or as a representative of yourself, um, depending on what you want to look like uh, and depending on what platform you own. But for the most part, it's basically shared virtual worlds. And what we really want the metaverse to be because it's not as interoperable as it should be, we're still working on. But the bones, the structure, the foundation of it is, is still there. And all of these other technologies are the undergirding of what will be the metaverse. So when we start talking about AI and machine learning and neural networks and all of these other infrastructures and data science and just blockchain and crypto and NFTs, all of these other things and technologies really give space for like the metaverse to be the umbrella term and for the rest of them to sit in the midst of how do I function in this particular space now that we are moving on from the second iteration of what the web is to the third iteration of what the web is. So you would say that the metaverse is kind of the third generation of the internet, like yeah. what we're going into next. Where do you see the metaverse? Just being in the next, I guess, decade or so, because I know when we heard of it, it had the hype, NFTs had the hype, then they kind of went down and kind of went down. And all we do is kind of play with our Oculus like I have. Where do you see that? <clears throat> Where do I see NFTs? Metaverse as a whole, us living in virtual reality or well, using that landscape. So the day will come because it is going to come. Let me see. Do I have? Yes, I do. I'm surrounded by headsets, so this part. <laughs> so the day will soon come because it's kind of come. So this, when we got this, we were like, yeah, because, because it is, you know, portable, small. It's not tethered to anything. I could use it without being hitched up to something, right? And now we got the Quest 3, mm -hmm. which is lighter, right? It's smaller. You can pair it. If you compare the two, you yeah. know, you, you're looking at a different size mm -hmm. bulk. This is a little bit bulkier. Um, but then if you look at Lenovo's glasses, right, they don't have yet the computing power. They still have to be tethered to like a mobile device or another type of computing source. But the day will come when we put on our glasses and just tap it. 
And then you will be able to see, you know, some augmented reality type of situation happening, whether it's the weather, what your calendar looks like, all kind of right here. And then I think that it's going to get to a place where it's not even going to be glasses and you won't have to wear anything actually on your eyes, but it's going to be so small as to be like just something that we stick behind our ears tap, and be able to move around and kind of see different things. And so computing will become more portable and more, so you won't be immersed. You will be in this immersive world, but it will be just like the world with augmentations or modifications to the world. And when you want to turn off those modifications, you can, but if you don't want to, and you want to stay immersed, then you can. Um, and I think that that's, similar to where we kind of are with computing in general, like computing, when they decided to make a smartphone, like who, who thought this was a great idea? And it's a wonderful idea, but I remember when mobile phones was like, hello. And then you had the, the cord and you had to have the bag in the car and all those kind of things. So like things have been clunky before and gotten smaller. I see in the next few years that, our kids will be taking their headset to school or taking just like they take their laptop to school. They'll be the connected child is in school. Oh, now. That. Oh, I cannot imagine that. But I think technology just has moved so much in the past. However many years I'm 16 and the iPhone came out the year I was born. So like to think of how much has changed since the iPhone came out is just wow. And so we're trying to teach my grandma how to use an iPhone right now. And the struggle and trying to get her to understand that, hey, this is an app where you need to swipe up to get out of call to go text somebody. Or grandma, look at the picture that my mom just sent you. She's like, what? What? where do you find that? I'm like, it's so different to see how generations work and when you're not used to it, you didn't grow up in it. But I do have a question. What yes. advice do you give to somebody that's trying to pursue a career in the metaverse and in VR, which seems so far from now, but I know isn't? It is. And we haven't even yet realized the positions, the jobs, the skills and all the things that will be necessary to really be able to have the metaverse that we actually imagine it to be. But my advice is, one, do the work. You have access to more research than and, and information than we ever have. So do your research, like Google everything. I know y'all workflow is a little different now. Y'all go on TikTok or real first, but I mean, there are other databases and things like that, that, you know, you can get glean some good, hard information from, but for the most part, it's moving so fast that you really actually have to read all the articles that come out that tech mm -hmm. companies are publishing, get on, um, become part of communities. So there's a lot of great communities that do this work and are looking at a humanity first approach. So Gatherverse is a great org to join. It's free. It's not something if you're a woman, X are women. Um, if you're a young girl, they're a great group to be a part of and to join. If you are just interested in looking at it from an academic perspective, our partners, Victory XR, they are wonderful for going and trying out some of the things. They have different plans where you can go and access their Victory XR labs in STEM. So if you have a MetaQuest 2, which you do, so I'm going I'm to hook you up with the, with, the, with the link so you can get there. But I tell people, do your research. Mm -hmm. Go to conferences, network, get on LinkedIn, see what people are talking about. LinkedIn is a great resource and you're never too young to really join. So many people or very few people actually that are my age that do have LinkedIn, but the ones who have it that met mentors and people they can follow to get into the careers they want to pursue. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the, that's the way to go. Mentorship is key for any level of success. And yeah. there's not going to be a one size fits all mentor. I have several. I'm going to play a game. And the game is called Show and Tell. And so I'm, and so I'm going to show a picture. And you're going to tell me a little bit about the picture. Oh, my goodness gracious. First picture. <laughs> I can do hard things. Oh, wow. So that was the, I was, um, I 
put on an event in Atlanta in my city, and I was so proud. At, um, yes. at the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center um, with the Chief Diversity Officer of Meta, and put that event on within two weeks, like literally two weeks, turned that event right, and it was beautifully attended, wonderful wonderfully representative of the work that we're doing and the innovation that's in the Atlanta University Center. I was so pleased over 120 young college students came out, uh, plus some to, to celebrate and to share and to learn about innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah. One thing I love about being from Atlanta, we always rep the city, show people who we are um, and have stuff. I know when I had my very first Microsoft event, at my Microsoft event at the Microsoft building downtown, it was one of their first events and it was like made me so warm inside and like had the biggest smile because I brought people from around Metro Atlanta to a place where they probably wouldn't have access to otherwise. And to know that, hey, this is in your hands and there's so many incredible things that you can get into. At Microsoft, I did this really cool VR experience, but I got to like meet a robot, but Ooh. it was right there. I couldn't touch it because it was VR, but I got to meet a robot and it was just so cool. And that guy came and did it at my Microsoft event and just showing youth and showing adults and showing everybody that there is so much more to STEM and to science than just your average astronaut, just your chemist that you know a little bit about. But when you go into it, there's so much more. It sure is. All right. Next picture. This is hilarious. Oh, my God, my babies. So I am. Yeah, I'm a molder of minds. And so I held this event for these young people, um, yes. for Jack and Jill. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. And um, we learned the science behind slime because I think that you're never too young to learn the scientific jargon that is behind it. So they learned a lot of words like um, polymer and monomer and um, elasticity. And, you know, they, they learned a, a lot. I kind of maybe taught them about triple point, but it, it don't matter. Like they learned about, <laughs> they learned some stem charts. They, they got some vocabulary that day. But they, they, did. Um, but they did. Because when I was making slime, I didn't know the vocabulary. Actually, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, if you go to my account, you scroll all the way down, all the videos. My very first video is me making slime. So <laughs> I like to say that I invented the little slime craze that happened because I did it the year before it went viral. Listen, I am so over slime. We have done, I have done slime. Everybody requests slime. So uh, that was such a fun event. And you know, that was, that event was, um, I did that event right before COVID. I think like that next month, the city was like the whole, everything shut down. Yeah, I think. Shut down. And many ways COVID impacted us. I got the reason I'm doing podcasts, I used to do IG lives and I would interview incredible women in science. And I did that because of COVID and because of all of this that I couldn't do. I couldn't do it in person. I was trying to find a way to still be me and still be who I am and talk about STEM, but do it on an online platform. Wonderful. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing. This is all incredible. I have so many questions. I'm learning so many things. I have one more picture for show and tell. Why did you go find all these? Like, I'm so emotional. Like, I, okay. Aww. Um, Black girls dream. Black girls dreams come true. Um, that picture was taken for a shoot on Morehouse's campus. I'm really about to cry. Okay. For a shoot on Morehouse's campus for CNN International, The Next Frontier. And when it aired in June, uh, which was my birthday month, and I, my cousin was taking me out to dinner at Juicy Crab and it aired and I got a chance to sit in the restaurant and watch myself on CNN International. And I was like, right after like Khan Academy and in between Minecraft. So, like for me, it was like people see you and your work is good and it's recognized. And so it's like for me, 
it was answered prayer. So when I see that picture, I see answered prayer. Because I always wonder, who was I going to be? When I was your age, I always looked at women like myself and I always wanted to know, could I make it? Would I be? Would I still make impact? Would I still ignite change? And when I see that, Black girl dreams do come true. That's fair. Just know that everybody, me especially, but I'm pretty sure everybody watching is proud of you. Knew that you would come this far. All the people in your life that were there from the beginning knew that you would do this. And I think it's really amazing. And I love being, I'm emotional too. Um, but I love that you could see that picture and that brings that joy to you and knows that you made a difference in so many people's lives, even if you don't know those people, or even if they never had the chance to tell you that you are doing incredible things for women, for Black women, and for STEM overall. Yeah, that was, <clears throat> that one, yeah. Yeah, because that's new. <laughs> that's a new photo. Um, I have a question because we started speaking about this one after the last picture. You started bringing this up. Um, what was what interested you in science from an early age? Because if you were wondering where you were going, what really pushed you in this career direction? You really want me to cry? I'm just okay. So this is gonna be just a trail of tears type of show because I'm gonna just cry. Um, so my brother Gordy, um is eight years older than me and he was a child prodigy. And at the age of four left, he had meningitis and it left him brain damaged. So when I was born, he was already ill. He had epilepsy, he had had a stroke. Um, my mom had gotten him back to where he could walk at the time, but he couldn't look down. It was just so many other things that he couldn't do. He's not really verbal. He's still alive, he's 53 and he's my muse. He was the reason why I went into science. I wanted to know what his mind did and what, what happened to him. And I wanted to be able to give my parents the language for understanding scientifically, like what really happened to him. So my imaginative play as a child was, how could I fix my brother? I knew something tragic had happened in my family that had starkly changed just the mood of who we were supposed to be. And it was like a perpetual sadness that existed in my mom's heart because she lost her son, but he was alive, but she still lost him. So for me, I was always wanting to spark joy into my family's life and improve the quality of our family life. And the only way that I could think to do it was through my own curiosity. Um, it was going to either take miracle or magic. So I have a strong faith and I'm a magician. It's called a chemist. I mean, I, I'm a chemist. I, I, you know, like I take substances and change it in other substances. Like, I mean, magic. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you cry, but I think that was really important for you to kind of let the audience know and just so many things can push people into STEM, of course. What advice or tips do you have for somebody who has an Oculus like me that just plays a couple games, but I feel like there's so much more that I could do with it? Oh my goodness, create. Ooh. Go create. Go figure out how to create. Go to Horizon Worlds if that's your thing, Spatial if that's your platform. Mm -hmm. I don't care what platform it is. Uh, you got shapes, VR, you got prisms, you got like, you got all these different apps. And my thing is the ones where you can create, even like, I think there's a Google art app and this lady has like six miles of art. Okay. Like she's just created because you can create your art, but she like has these murals and she just get bored and she just paints. And she was like over the, two and a half years, I think she's been doing it. She's created six miles worth of art, basically, like if you were to spread it all out, right? But people can go in and look and see and view. But I mean, for me, it's about how can you use these applications, these platforms? How can you develop your own VR app? Or as a creator, I'm not, you don't even have to be a technologist, like just as a creator, go in there and create the space you want to see. If it's not there, go create it. it there's yeah. never been a time like now where you can go create what you want to see. So 
that's the number one thing. Go and create. Don't be a consumer alone. Create. Now, if you want to do something real, real fun, look, look, I'm speaking to your mama. I'm not talking to you. Go do this mindfulness practice stuff. That stuff there is powerful. Get your mind all the way right to deal with your children. So since I'm a mom of five sons and a wow. wife, I have five boys. The oldest is 27. The baby is six. I'm in the trenches still. Um, and then I have an autism baby too. So what made me persist into STEM and technology is creating inclusion for those who are neurodivergent in this area so that they can have quality jobs. So a lot of the work I do is on making sure that I can make these practices inclusive and accessible. Dr. Morris, thank you so much for teaching me about VR, letting us get into your backstory that really connected us with you. One thing that I have all the guests say before we leave, I need you to say STEM girl swag because I'm a STEM girl. And since you're from Atlanta and in STEM, you're definitely a STEM girl. STEM girl swag. Hey. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. It was so much fun getting to talk to you about VR and things that I'm interested in. And I know everybody watching wants to get into because this is your future. So for more information, go to Just Simple. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Morris. Thank you. I'll just plug you in with Dr. Morris. Learn more about VR. If you have an Oculus like me, or if you just want to stay connected and get into chemistry, go to Morehouse. You're from Atlanta and you want to meet a scientist, go follow her. Subscribe, like, and comment, and thank you for watching.